The first round of the NFL draft is nine days away. Our guy Todd McShay with us again. So a couple different exercises that I want to get into. And I know Todd wants to talk like trade exploration here, which I, by the way, I got to give Todd a little bit of a heads up. He, he and I were, I don't know that it was an argument about New England and Arizona moving around, but now there's reports based on the exact thing that Todd was theorizing on. So we'll uh, we'll discuss that revisit a little bit. But I like doing these exercises because we had Todd around. I feel so like much you just you just brushed over it. So and then we'll get to like 29 minutes. So yeah, we can't really get to it today. But no, that's good. Okay, maybe I don't yeah, know. I just crossed we'll out the rundown. We had to, <laughs> we had Todd in so much during the ESPN days that. Uh, we would try to get creative with different things as he would sit there and live in Southington in a hotel for like two months across the street. So I want to do this. I want to do some career projection debates here where I'm going to give you some first round picks and I'm going to say, if this player turns into this player, is that a win or is that you know disappointing? So let's just start at the top. The first one, Caleb Williams. If Caleb Williams ends up being Russell Wilson for his career, is that a win or is that disappointing? Ugh. I mean, you always make the game hard. I get it. And that's, that's your job, right? But I think when you think of Russell Wilson, it's hard not to look back at the last couple of years and what has happened with Russell Wilson. But I mean, for a long time, Russell Wilson, if he wasn't the best quarterback in the league, he certainly was in the conversation for the top three, four quarterbacks in the league. So he won a 2014 Super Bowl. But like you got this generational talent, right? And we're making all the comparisons to Patrick Mahomes. So it's it's difficult to say, yeah, I could live with that. I, and uh, quite honestly, if his career winds up being being Russell Wilson, and, and look back at the last couple, tr- you know, um, you know these these generational talents. He's the best since Peyton Manning came out in the draft. He's the best since you know, it was Andrew Luck for a while, right? And then it was Trevor Lawrence. Well, Andrew Luck retired early because of injury, carried his team. He was off, off, you know, off to a great start. And we thought he was going to have a phenomenal career and win win multiple Super Bowls. It didn't happen. Trevor Lawrence, terrible rookie year, made a huge jump with Doug Peterson the next year, but now he's kind of leveled off. Is he ever going to take that next step? So if I'm Ryan Poles, I'm the general manager and say, you know what? I can get, I don't even know the, the amount of years, but like a seven, eight year run with Caleb playing at the level that Russell was playing at, considering that we're talking about first round quarterbacks and 40% hit rate and all those, I'd say, yeah, like I'm hoping for more. I want something a lot closer to what you see in Kansas city with, 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 uh, Trev- with, um, with Patrick Mahomes. But if you're telling me that that's the floor and, and we're going to win a super bowl with him and he's going to be one of the, the elite quarterbacks in the league for, for a good period of time. Yeah. I, I guess I could live with that. What do you think? Like, what, What's your mindset on that? I don't even think it's debatable. I think it's a huge win. Okay. That's why I did it. Because I think yeah. what you said at the top is what a lot of people would do when they first heard this, right? Where you go, oh, uh, yeah, it's Russell Wilson. Like, are you kidding? It's not just, okay, automatically you get a Super Bowl because it matches Russell Wilson. But I mean, you know, I don't, it's, it's, it's my game, but I'm not quite sure what the rules are. But if you go through... <laughs> The first <laughs> that lines up right if you go through his first what do we got here nine seasons yeah he's, i was guessing eight but yeah yeah you know in the beginning too like he wasn't asked to do as much because the defense was so good but then he kind of took it to another level here i mean he's all pro three of his first four years he's all pro four times Yep. Uh, you've got the two Super Bowl appearances. So, I, you know, I guess the game isn't like, okay, this means Bears fans, you get a Super Bowl and you lose in the other one. That's too, like, of course you sign up for that. But I think the biggest part that you'd be forgetting if you're pushing back on that, because it's like, well, he sucked at the end and he's given the m- most annoying interviews in pro sports in the last decade plus. Uh, that's that's not what I'm talking about. Like, look at the hit rate, which we've covered at a nauseating rate. And you're like, oh, so wait, that's what I get? I get right. that? Okay, and, done. So I don't. Yeah, I'm going to relieve myself of that sixty percent chance that we've that recent history has shown of this guy just being a bust and like not even getting to a second contract. So yeah, right. I'm signing up for it. Yeah. So I I don't even think you have to spend a ton of time on that one. Okay, let's uh let's try Dallas Turner. Projected maybe eight Atlanta. You know, let's just say within that range. You can correct me based on kind of the ranges that I wrote down here. What if Dallas Turner ends up being Leonard Floyd? Yeah, I I don't think it's a terrible comp for starters. I think I think Dallas Turner is more polished than Leonard Floyd. Leonard Floyd Leonard Floyd was 
you know, a great athlete who flashed a lot in college at Georgia, but got to the NFL and still was working things out, had some injury history, but like, and, and I would hope if I'm using the number eight pick and, and I think Dallas Turner, just to kind of give a little perspective, he, he may be the only defensive player that gets drafted in the top 10 in this, this upcoming draft next Thursday. So that's going to be interesting to watch, but with Floyd for so long, you waited and, and a second team and all, like, Leonard Floyd has 30, 39 and a half sacks the last four years. So I, I, I would take it, but the problem is, is he going to be on his second team? If, if I'm Atlanta, is he going to be with a different team because he had injury problems? He, he wasn't developed enough. He, he just didn't give us, he was giving us three, five sacks a year for the first four or five years. A, am I comfortable with that? So if I'm Atlanta drafting, I'd say no. No, I'm not. I'm not cool with that. Like I, I would go in a different direction if that's the game we're playing, because I'm not sure he's going to be here for the second contract. But if I if I'm getting the player that we've seen the last four years, absolutely, I'll take about ten sacks a year from a guy that I'm drafting at number eight. God knows Atlanta needs it. Yeah, Floyd's a weird story, just because you're like, oh, did he get that much better, or was he playing with a better defensive front? Clearly, yep. when you're playing yeah, with it's all those. Donalds, you're just right. So. But he still had decent numbers in Buffalo. And then the fact that San Francisco was interested in him, although you could say, hey, they were interested in Chase Young too. And that's they interested work in out. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're a defensive <laughs> lineman that has a poster at Models, the Niners are like, yeah, we'll, we'll take a that. Poster guy. at Models. All right. Let's go. Uh, let's go receiver here. Let's go, Brian Thomas. So he's mid first projection, maybe late teens. You know, who knows? What if he ends up being Chris Godwin? Godwin's got four 1,000-yard seasons. Clearly, Thomas is bigger than Godwin. The touchdown yep. numbers for Godwin have dipped. Yeah, I think, I think, I think T- Brian Thomas is more like a faster T. Higgins. You know, if we're, if we're doing NFL comps, but that's not what I, well, we're I wasn't doing. doing it. Not everybody had to be a perfect body comp. Yeah, so no, I, I get just, it. I get it. I would say yes. Go read the Athletic. They, there was a good—I I forget who wrote it. There was a really good article about about the hit hit and miss rates on wide receivers over you know a 10, 12 year span, whatever it was. It ain't good, but it's gotten a hell of a lot better the last few years. You know, you go back. I've I've mentioned that that twenty twenty draft and how great that was. Not just the first round, but the second round, guys in the third and fourth round, all that. And you go back just two years ago, and and the hit rate is is really good, especially at the top of the draft. And he's going to be, you got to remember, he's going to be the fourth receiver taken. And the hit rate in the last four or five years for the first, you know, two, three guys, guys drafted in the top 15, 20 um, is really good. But when you get to that later first round where I think Brian Thomas is going to be somewhere in that, I would guess, you know, 15 to 20, 23 range is, is where he winds up getting drafted. So if you're telling me he's going to have multiple thousand yard you know, receiving seasons. Yeah, I, I would probably take it because again, a little bit going back to to Russell Wilson, I'm I'm taking out that floor. You know, I'm I'm, rise, I'm raising the floor because of the bust factor won't be there. Chris Godwin has not been a bust. He has been a productive receiver. He's been an explosive receiver. He's been dynamic at times. So I, I would take it. Uh, I certainly would want more if I'm using a, the 15th, 17th overall pick. If I'm to the Saints or whoever, wherever he winds up going, but I, I would take it. Yeah, because I, you know, I could do this and just name somebody who isn't any good, and you're just like, well, no, that would be disappointing. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, I know. Great, I know. great job. But I've had. But if you're going to ask me, I'm going to talk right. through it. I'm not just going right. to. Yep, that would be a, that would be a really shitty segment if I was just like, yep, no, it'd be a bad I mean, segment. But I also think it's a it's a good answer because Godwin's good. He is like he's he's really good. But like the same way, if your team takes Dallas Turner and you take him in the top ten, and you go. Cool. Here's Leonard Floyd. Well, here's the, the deal. reaction's get- going to be no. I still think there'll be people listening to the Caleb Williams Russell Wilson thing being like not good I enough. I know, I know, but that's that's why I, I think we're relatively reasonable a good portion of the time, and we we talk through it, and and clearly that's the right play. Uh, listen, if, if you're drafting, if you're using the number four pick, you're Arizona and taking Marvin Harrison Jr. and you're getting Chris Godwin, I'm pissed. If you're using the number five pick, but probably more likely the number six pick. And, and, you know, and, and you're getting um, Odunze, then, you know, well, Odunze is going to go a little. If you're getting Malik Neighbors, let's say number six, Malik Neighbors, the Giants take Malik Neighbors and you get Chris Godwin, I'm pissed. Odunze, you're like, I want more right. coming out of That's Washington. What- but, uh, but 
I would, I would, this one would be tougher with Odunze versus Godwin. When you get into the bottom half of the first round, talk about the fourth receiver in a class. If I'm getting Chris Godwin, I'm like, yeah, sign me up. Okay, good. All right, let's go defensive side here again. Brian Murphy, D tackle out of Texas. He's projected to say, I don't know, early 20s. Maybe somebody goes, look, we'll grab the D tackle. Because I think his best film, Murphy, and you know, again, I'm not watching it like you are, but I think when Murphy shows up in those awesome moments, it's yeah. it's incredible. And I don't really like hearing about how D tackles like, oh, he just give us a quick Brian Murphy actual breakdown, by the way, for maybe people who aren't as familiar with him, you know, at his position that's just so hard Un- to find. Uh, undersized, shorter than ideal. You know, he's gonna play it about he'll probably get to like 300, 305, somewhere in that range. I think he weighed in just under 300, like 297, somewhere in that range. Um, quick quickness and power. First step bursts, but he is a ball of power. He's different than some other guys like Brandon Fisk from Florida State. He, yeah, he's, he's powerful, but like it's more about that acceleration and quickness and penetrating as a three, uh, three technique guy. And, and I, I think Murphy can be, will be a three technique and a good penetrator. But I think the combination of quickness and power is what makes him better than a lot of the other guys. You know, so like uh, Javon Hargrave to me is kind of like they're similar in size, but like Hargrave wasn't just like speed up. the Like it was power with the speed that made him, you know, who he was coming out of college and everything like that. So Brian Murphy, that that's the kind of player he is. So I, I think that's that's kind of what you're looking for. And, and when you get guys that can play that spot and disrupt, if you have that kind of scheme, you're looking for one gap penetrators, not like the two gap, you know, hold the line type of guys or, or a versatile guy that can play inside and outside and all that. If you just want one thing, and and that's what your scheme asks for. Brian Murphy's going to be really attractive to teams in that like 15 to 25 range. Yeah, and I would say like the point that I had a hard time getting through was that his best stuff looks incredible. And I know that for any football player you put together the highlight tape, like, you know, there's all sorts of, there's international basketball players. I'm like, oh my God, who's this guy undrafted? Right. Because his YouTube mixtape was incredible. But I think Murphy is in that conversation. All right, so I, it's funny you brought up Hargrave because I go, if I say Hargrave, then it's an automatic yes. Right. If you get that, if you get Hargrave, you're like, okay, you should have gone higher. What if it's Eric Armstead? <laughs> Terrible comp. I know we're not doing comps. So it <laughs> makes comp. it, right, because you're, ask, you're asking for like a, a five technique that's going to, you know, play with gap discipline and all those things. But from like a, pro, if we're just looking production standpoint, what he's meant, not just stats wise, but what he's meant to the team. <laughs> Because, because I, the reason I'm I'm smirking is because I know what Eric Armstead represents for you. Good player, <laughs> I want more. Every yeah, time, exactly. You and I probably had five different times during this fall. It's been a wonderful fall run. I don't know that we'll ever get to work together as much as we did this past fall. But every time you bring up Eric Armstead and the conversations we were having about Bosa and you know and and bringing in Chase Young and, and 49, like all that stuff. Every time you brought up Armstead, it was like, I'm looking for more. So Probably I probably brought it up too much, but that's yeah. why I did it because I just so can't stop talking t- about it. Yeah. And, and I understand that like, he's a he's a damn good player. Like he does good. what he's asked to do. He's a good player, but he's not an impact player. He's not a, a massive difference maker in terms of production, disrupting all sorts of things. He does his job. And so I would say, I'd say, no, I'll roll the dice. I, I want more than Eric Armstead in terms of what he's providing. But again, they're they're such different players. They are, they are. But I was, I was trying to to do this in a sense of like, hey, this is what your expectation was. This is what you ended up getting. Right, and, and I just need the listener, the viewer, to understand. Right. Like Eric Armstead is probably viewed like as a seven and a half out of ten scale player. You view him as like a steady six. Yeah, probably. So and I just I, want everyone to know what I'm what I'm up against right. here. Yeah, and I think there's you know a little injury <laughs> excuse for it this year, which is yep. you know what what a lot of people would tell you. All right, I'm going to I'm going to spare you as I was working through these today. I was like, "All right, give me I was like, is he going to go for Kool-Aid McKinstry and Ronald Darby?" So I'm going to spare you that one. I appreciate you. And I want to try to find I want to try to find one for Nate Wiggins, who I cannot quit. I know the history. I don't know where I read it. I need to find it again, but it, it basically somebody did this fantastic job of going through like Nate Wiggins size and then looking at the history and how rare it is that this is going to work out and yet i just loved him 
I loved him in a season where there wasn't a lot to love. I, I think he's a, a damn good player. I really do. Right. I think he, I, I think the thing that gets lost because everyone's going to you're going to look at two things, right? You got a, a measurable of, a, of one uh, 173 pounds is I think what he weighed in at the combine, which is scary. And yeah, there's and it, we could do the the research. There's not a lot of guys that, at that weight, so you're hoping he bulks up and, and but you hope he maintains his speed as he gets to like 185, right? And his speed, what, what did he run? Uh, I'll tell you right now. He ran a four four two eight. I thought it was four. Yeah, four two eight. The scary part is, it's like you want your corners in that four three range, or your receivers for that. How many guys who run the four twos actually are great in the league? I'd like to do that. You know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to I'm going to spend some do time that this for weekend. us next week. Seriously, yeah. that'd yeah, be I'm gonna, that'd be I'm awesome. I'm writing it down right now. Four right. twos because the like the remember the Raiders drafted all those. Yeah, Fabian Washington. Yeah, all the, all those are like everyone. Well, with John Ross, those, John Ross, exactly. So it, it were, and then and then it, like it was almost like you're looking at the preview of what could potentially go wrong. You saw he weighed in the day before 173 pounds, runs a four two eight, and he gets injured because those guys. What you worry about is they're too tightly wound as athletes, right? But on tape. It's interesting because you got that measure when you think, well, he's just a burner. He can run with it. He he can play off coverage. He can play some zone. He can do different things. He's a he's a damn good football player. I think, you know, this class at cornerback is better than people think. You got Terry on Arnold from Alabama who came on. I love his makeup. I love his physicality. I think he's going to be a really good corner. I think he'll probably be the first corner off the board, but it could very well be Quinion Mitchell, who again, very complete player. And and ran a four three three at the combine after a phenomenal week at the Senior Bowl. And then Nate Wiggins to me is the number three corner behind those two uh, those two guys. And Cooper DeGene from Iowa, who just by the way, some some recent news, ran in the low four fours at his makeup pro day at Iowa. I think he can play corner, he can play nickel, he can play free safety, he can do it, and he's a punt returner. So you've got four guys at that cornerback spot that I think are going to be really good players at the next level. And Wiggins, I would probably put it number three on that list. Is it safe to say like people like Kool-Aid more last year? Absolutely safe to say. Yeah. Absolutely. So what happened there? Because I okay, struggled, he struggled on tape. He he was inconsistent. Big games didn't play great. Worried about his inconsistency. Almost like, why come back? He didn't seem as aggressive and physical and like dialed in all the time like he was the year before. He was great on tape the year before. Thought he was going to take that next step. Sometimes guys come back and it's like subconsciously, I'm not saying consciously, certainly not in that Alabama program. Are you going to come back and and like, you know, go through the mo- But I, I I thought he played a lot better the year before and it, it just felt like watching the tape. I hate that, like, you played not to get injured. It's not that. It's like, you know, it's just not that same. Like, I've got my life is on the line type attitude and feel and the way he was playing. I didn't see that consistency from him this past year. He's a good player. Gets in the right situation. Veteran leadership around him. Kind of, you know, it, it's kind of brought along a little bit. And not not in a situation where he could get burned, you know, early in his career and start to get like some confidence issues. I think Kool-Aid can be a really good player. I think he will be a really good player, but, um, but I I think there's enough worry there that he's probably going to be an early second round pick. All right. So let's get back to the comp game. What if Brock Bowers turns into ends up being TJ Hawkinson? I want more. I don't, I, I just, I want a little more. Brock is tough, man. Like everyone's talking about the Jets at 10. The Jet, the Jet, first of all, the Jets don't, we can get into this a little bit. Jets don't have a, a second round pick or a fifth round pick. Like, are they going to just stay there and take a, a tight end when they they need to get younger at tackle? If it doesn't go there, is it down to like 15 Colts, you know, Saints, 17, somewhere that? So, like, there's questions on where he goes. He looks like a tall banker, you know, a guy who was really good and is like in high school basketball, but like, you know, did, decided not to play D3 basketball and, and went to like a big program, like went to a big school like Georgia so he could hang out with the frat guys. You know, like he doesn't look the part, you know, when you see him and you compare him to some of the other guys that we've talked about as first round tight ends. He doesn't look the part. He worked out recently at the um, at the Georgia makeup pro day. That was the, the big ones were Iowa and, and then Georgia with Brock Bowers and, um, and Amarius Mims and didn't, you know, didn't didn't run, didn't do the, all those things, did like the position drills. So there's questions, but on tape, I don't have any questions. I mean, he's never going to be a great blocker. He'll give you some effort, but my goodness, that dude knows how to get open. 
He's unbelievable after the catch for a tight end. I think I just I will be shocked if he is not an instant impact player and it doesn't within the first year or two become one of the like Sam Laporta the year he had. I'm expecting more out of Brock Bowers as a rookie than Laporta provided for Detroit, which was a hell of a lot as a rookie. And I'm expecting his his career, you know, arc to be higher than what Laporta has already shown and, and will continue to show, is my guess. I'm with you on Bowers. And, you know, I remember talking about like mocks on the NBA side and I I brought up some of this stuff, but it was, I was like, oh man, this guy seems to be dropping in the GMs. Like, yeah, to you guys and your mocks. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And so Bowers feels like somebody that's been dropping just based on mock charting. Well, and it's it's also, it's, 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 it's a position, positional value thing. Like you got to remember, the, like these general managers sit, are sitting down with their analytics people and, the, and their cap people and all of that. It's not just like, oh shit, Brock Bowers is one of the best five, six, seven players in the, in the league. Like, yeah, we all know that. But what am I getting? Like this, this whole thing is about you know risk aversion, and, and then like, what's the value of the position? Like, I, for a tight end, can I pay top ten money? When, when you think about it, like, if I can get a quarterback for the next five years in the top 10 and pay him that compared to what every all these other quarterbacks are getting, if I look at the, the wide receiver market and how much they're getting paid, and you're telling me I can go get a, a Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors who are going to be stars in the league for that money for four or five years, and I can take the rest of that money that it would cost me to get a veteran and go peel off and, and find three, four other players— like that's the thing that people have to realize because that's what's going on in these draft meetings when they're talking and they're trying to figure out what to do. So when Brock Bowers is sitting on the clock at number 14, and everyone's like, wait, I thought he was one of the seven or eight best players. He still is, but he plays a position that you just, you like, first of all, you better be 100% sure. And there's really no such thing in the draft, but you also would have to have a guy who didn't, it wasn't nicked up a little bit, looked more of the part, you know, confirmed that he ran in the the high four fours. You know what I mean? Like, so all those things would have to play in. So he's not falling. It's a position value thing and making sure that when you're drafting that high, I need a tackle. I need a quarterback. I need a tackle. I need a receiver. I need a pass rusher. I need a guy who can cover these, these great wide receivers who are coming into the league now. And then after that, I get the second, third, fourth, fifth round to go find other impact players at, at the other positions. Yeah, TJ... It probably, I think part of that answer is that it took a little longer for him. You could also talk about the quarterback situation, you know, not always being ideal for TJ. Size wise, he's huge. I wonder if Brock's draft status took a hit just standing next to Gronk in that picture. Yeah, that but, was a bad look. But I mean, look, we're talking about Brock and we're like, oh my God, look how little he looks. Okay, he's 6'3, 243. So the program had him at 6'4. Here's what I know is that on Saturdays, he had moments where he looked like the best player in college football. So yes, I I think he could be Dallas you. Clark. Like I th- I think Dallas Clark would be like if give me Dallas Clark and I'll say yeah, like that, the career that he had. Yeah. 